Well, suppose we had two people standing before us this morning and we're talking about ways they needed to improve or areas that they needed to work on, part of their plan to get to a better place. And, and person number one was a real learner. He's genuinely listening to what's being said, even though it's not particularly comfortable. He's humble, so he considers the truthfulness of the analysis, even though it was different than the way he had been evaluating himself. He even asks clarifying questions because he views this as a redemptive moment in his life. And he doesn't want to miss what God is trying to do in and through the person who's taking a risk and telling him the truth. Then um, there's person number two. And can you picture the, the polar opposite of what I've just described? This individual is defensive and argumentative. He's proud, so he's not really even listening to what the other person is trying to say. He's quick to anger, and even the tone of his voice and the look on his face and the movements of his body make it very clear that even well-worded, balanced, helpful criticism is not welcome. So he shuts the conversation down, and he goes away unchanged. Well, I think we can all imagine that scenario, can't we? Let me ask you a couple of questions as a result. First of all, which person would you rather spend time with? Which one would you prefer to have as a friend or as a, a co-worker, a neighbor or a family member, a church member or a spouse? Well, that one's pretty easy, isn't it? Then I would ask, which person are you more like? If you gave those options to somebody who knows you well, those two descriptions I just gave, and asked them to pin your tail on one of those two donkeys while you blindfolded yourself, um, which person would they say you're most like? And would they hang around long enough to see your response after you remove the blindfold? Then thirdly, who do you think would make the best long-range planner? What, if anything, does the issue of how you handle criticism play into the planning process? That's a pretty important question. With that in mind, I want to invite you to open your Bible this morning to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, that's on page 122 of the back section of the Bible under the chair in front of you if you need that this morning. So Romans chapter 6, or page 122 of the back section of the New Testament of the Bible under the chair in front of you. Our church's theme this year is planning to grow, planning to grow, and one of our key verses is Proverbs 21 verse 5, which says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance. That's a promise from God. And certainly that's the kind of life we want to lead, one that's characterized by uh, abundance. Not, not in the sense of what we accumulate for ourselves, but in what we accomplish for God, huh? And both as individuals and as a church, it's like Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Uh, but Jesus came so that they would have life and we would have it how? Abundantly. So, we're planning to grow because the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance. Now, hopefully by now, when you hear that theme, you already start going down these three trails, these three emphases that we have when we talk about it all year long. One is to continue to discuss and refine and implement our discipleship process. We're really serious about being the kind of place where every person who comes, regardless of the baggage you might bring, that you're able to connect in your relationship with the Lord, in your relationship with other people, and you're able to get busy growing. And um, we're already seeing evidence of that being played out, and that's good. Planning to grow, that's an important part of what that means. And then secondly, to organize and launch our new cluster of ministries over at Faith West. Really exciting things happening over there. We had a great halfway home um, luncheon. Our contractor provided for all of the workers this week, a great time of celebration Good group of folks yesterday got together and just helped clean up um, Faith West, and you'll hear more about some things we're going to try to do next Saturday. But the bottom line is that is moving ahead full steam. Praise God for that, huh? What an opportunity to grow as we think about the many new ministry opportunities there. And then thirdly, working together as a church family to develop our next five-year strategic ministry plan. And we're into that process now a month. 
And um, some very good things have already taken place. I'm very thankful for those who are working so diligently on those teams. Now, in the first quarter of the year, we're focusing specifically in our Sunday morning messages on becoming a person with a plan. And we've all heard that phrase, a man with a plan. Well, let's broaden that out to include everybody. Because if, if it's true that the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, why, we all want to be persons with a plan, huh? Or a series of plans. And I frequently have people tell me, well, okay, fine, but I don't know how. Or I can't get motivated to do it. Well, because we're an equipping church, this quarter we want to study what God's Word says about how to help our church family not only know what we ought to be doing, but how to. So that's what we're working on in this first quarter of the year. Well, where are we then in the process? You could view us as being ready to begin step four this morning. Let me review quickly, though. We started by talking about the value and the importance of planning. That's where it starts at step one. Because if we're not motivated to do it, it's just not going to get done. We know that. So we went to this challenging text in Proverbs 6. Go to the ant, O sluggard, because honestly, there is a laziness issue here. Observe her ways and be wise, which having no chief officer or ruler prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest, etc. In other words, the ant is an insect that plans, and we can learn something from that. We want to overcome our laziness. That's the motivation. Then your service pastor, Pastor Folden, spoke with you, secondly, about the, the goal of the process, the defining your mission, and because effective planning has to be heading somewhere. And for a follower of Christ, that goal is greater Christ-likeness, or a living in a way that is more pleasing to God, or glorifying the Lord, or increasingly effective stewardship. And that is so important because it brings into focus this myriad of things that we have going on in a given day, knowing the goal of your plan. And there's many verses from the Word of God that can help us, but one of our bread and butter ones is Romans 8, 28, 29. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, not for everybody, but to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. In other words, you're heading somewhere and it's a place He wants you to go. And those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. So there's the first two steps. And we have the motivation and we have the goal. Now, just push the pause button on that for a moment and um, just add this data point. We're encouraging you to be thinking about planning in three to four different areas of your life. Um, you'll have to decide how formal you want this to be. The goal isn't to have a bunch of written plans. It's living in a wise, productive way. But we're encouraging you to use these principles that we're studying from the Word of God and actually putting together a, a personal growth plan. And then secondly, to help us think through our church's growth plan this year. And then I've encouraged you to think about the specific ministry that you're involved in right now. I hope you have at least one of those, and drilling down and applying these principles to that. And I've said you can even use this if you want to in your own work or your business ministry growth plan as well. It's certainly God's Word that will help you there. So hopefully, in each one of those four areas, we are motivated to plan, and you have a consistent goal or purpose or mission. Well, what happens next? What is step three? We talked about that last Sunday. It's the matter of identifying your core values in each one of those areas, evaluating your key effectiveness areas or your priorities. Well, why is that important? At least two reasons. You have to be advancing in multiple areas simultaneously. And nobody has the luxury of only focusing on one area of life to the neglect of everything else. It's like juggling. And where one of the secrets to keeping all the balls in the air is not holding any one for too long. So you have to decide, what are the areas of life that I need to be valuing right now? What are my God-given priorities that I need to be advancing in simultaneously? The other reason that step is so crucial is because you can only juggle so many balls regardless of who you are at a time. So core values or priorities tell you which areas you absolutely will not allow to crash. You'll not allow to hit the floor. You'll not allow to go unattended or go unaddressed. That then becomes the framework on which the planning process develops. 
Now, last week somebody made a very helpful suggestion, and I appreciate this. I obviously have my way of thinking and my way of um, presenting material, but if there's something that's confusing to you or a better way to do it, I'm wide open to hearing that. And somebody said, you know, I'm, I'm a visual learner. It would help me not just to hear about this, to actually see this. That makes sense. So I appreciate the work that um, Heather Smith, my professional assistant, did in just helping me try to visualize some of this. But, but you could think about your personal growth plan now with your core values added. And you'll have to decide exactly what your core values are, but the ones that we recommended last week from the Word of God would be valuing your relationship with Christ, valuing your family, valuing your church, your work, and then others that you might add. But that's the way you think about this planning grid. And then we already have one, a set of core values as a church, the matter of growing stronger, that is progressive sanctification for every one of us, reaching out the matter of outreach and assimilation, serving together, which is obviously what it sounds like, meeting needs is what we mean by identifying needs in the community that we want to meet, and then strengthening others, caring about other churches and missionaries around the world. Those are our core values, and so our planning initiatives hang on that. And then I just selected one for a specific ministry growth plan. And let's say that you're a person who teaches second grade Sunday school, and I'm glad you are. But I've encouraged you to think about what are your core values in that specific ministry area. And so here's some possible ones. I would hope that one of our Sunday school teachers here would have a value of praying for their students. I hope you care about that and you act on it. I hope you care about, you value working with families because you understand biblically it's not the church's job to raise kids in the nurture and admonition of Christ. It's the church's job to assist parents. So you would see your task, your teaching Sunday school as being in concert with and supporting the work of families, parents, and then thirdly, welcoming guests. I hope you would value that if you're a second grade Sunday school teacher, that you would want to have as part of the DNA you're building in your class a friendliness to the person who's new. I hope you would also value wanting to become a better teacher. I hope you would say, I'm not just going to do the same thing over and over and over. I want to get better at that. And so you're thinking about, how can I be more creative? I want to value passion in the way I teach, et cetera, et cetera. And then lastly, I hope you would value long-term faithfulness. You say, well, I don't. Well, you should. I just gave you that little core value because I love you. Because too many of God's people have the view that serving is something I do for like the next five minutes. No, serving is something you ought to want to do for God until you die. Why would you want to retire from that? I hope you'll want to be the kind of person who says, when my head hits the pillow, the silk one, in the casket, that's when I'll talk about retiring from serving God. <laughs> Ever thought why they have? It's really comfortable in there. That's why. <laughs> but until then, we're going to joyfully serve God while we have the strength to do so, huh? Please tell me you value that or I'll change this sermon right now. All right, then. All right. See, you got me off track. And, um, and as I said, you could apply the same thing to your work or, or business, and maybe these are some of the things you might value in that particular area of life. And eventually, we're going to want to have specific planning initiatives to help us advance in each one of those key effectiveness areas. That's the whole point of this. But that's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, because here's the next step. Say, how, how can I do that? Well, here you go. It's a matter of recognizing our strengths and our weaknesses. Friends, you have to go through a, a process of analysis in order to craft plans that are going to help you focus on what needs to happen next. You have to be honest about where you are. It's a lot like running a marathon with hurdles. It, really, the Christian life is that. It's like running a marathon race with hurdles. We're, we're in it for the long haul. That's the marathon piece. But there are certain hurdles that could potentially trip you up. So it's not enough to say, well, I'm running in a race. No, you have to know where you're going, but also what is the next specific step? Or what is the next coming obstacle? Or what is the next specific opportunity? So not just, well, I'm running in a race. But no, there's a hurdle, 36 inches high, 25 feet ahead, and here's what I'm going to do to clear it. Now, now please hear me on this. You cannot craft a plan that is that specific. Here's the next thing. You can't craft a plan that is that specific and is that focused without humbly going through a process of analysis. Remember the two guys at the beginning? Which one are you most like? And here's what that looks like for the visual learners among us. For your personal growth plan, you've thought about your core values, 
but now you're going to start thinking about your strengths, and you're going to start thinking about your weaknesses. As we do this as a church, we've got our core values there, and we're going to talk about our strengths. We ought to praise God for that, but we're also going to have to be honest about our weaknesses in your particular ministry area. Well, if you highly value prayer, do you do it? It's a matter of thinking through your strengths and thinking through your weaknesses, and then even if you would like to apply that exact same process um, to what you're doing in your work and your business analysis. That's the point. Now, with that in mind, let's look at Romans chapter 6 and see Paul doing the exact same thing, both about his strengths and also his weaknesses. A great model of what I'm talking to you about this morning. Romans 6, beginning in verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. There's some good news. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves, this is a strength, to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. All of that is like really strong. Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you would obey its lusts. And don't go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law but under grace. Now, for sake of time, look at chapter 7, verse 14. Now he's going to especially think about the weakness side. He said, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm of the flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I'm doing, I don't understand I'm not practicing what I would like to do. I'm doing the very thing I hate. There's authenticity. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good I want, I don't do. But I practice the very evil I don't want. But if I'm doing the very thing I don't want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, and the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully confer with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death, thanks be to God. And through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. And what an important passage from the Word of God. And with that, we want to talk about recognizing your strengths, as Paul did in Romans 6, and also your weaknesses, as Paul did in Romans 7. So from that text, let's look for three steps to analyzing your current situation wisely. How do we do this? How do we do this? Well, you have to develop a balanced and biblical way of evaluating yourself. See, what stands out in these chapters is that at times Paul speaks about himself positively but without pride, and at other times in the same discussion speaking about himself negatively but without self-loathing. It's a marvelous model of what he's going to advocate to the Roman Christians a few chapters later. When he says in Romans 12, 3, please lock on to this, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but, here it is, to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. I really believe if we don't learn to accomplish that step well, to be honest about our strengths and equally honest about our weaknesses, either as individuals or as a church, our plans either will be non-existent or they'll be very fuzzy or maybe even misdirected. We have to learn this well. So 
really talking now about the importance of making sound judgments. What does that mean? To think so as to have sound judgment. You know, one of the more bizarre periods of time in the history of secular psychology, it was the height of the self-love, self-image, self-esteem movement. Now, I know some of you are too young to even know at all what I'm talking about, but 25 years ago in our culture, that was the rage. And so we had teachers being told to ignore wrong answers on a student's math paper because it would be better for the student to feel good about his ability to do math, even if that feeling was contrary to the fact that he had just actually given the wrong answer on his math test. And what was especially troubling about that period of time in our culture was that so many people in the evangelical church bought that entire approach, hook, line, and sinker, sprinkled a few Bible verses on top, and tried to Christianize it. And they were very successful during that time. I think of one Christian teacher, if I told you his name, you would know him. He still teaches, but not like this anymore. But during that time, he would say, you know, I, I travel a lot, and sometimes I feel depressed. And so I find that it helps if I stand in the hotel room in front of the mirror and just say to myself, I love you, you're a wonderful person, over and over and over until I don't feel depressed anymore. He went on to say, with a straight face, that sometimes that doesn't work, and what I found to be helpful is that I send myself two dozen roses with a card that says, I love you, you are a wonderful person. <laughs> Think about that, happy Valentine's Day to me. <laughs> and um, the, the tragedy of that was, instead of taking time, to, as the Scripture would tell us, to, to carefully analyze what was going on in his thinking what was going on in his desires and his behavior that might be leading to those depressed feelings. He was suggesting that the way you feel better about yourself, whether the analysis is connected to actual facts or not, that process was somehow going to provide lasting relief. And we had pressure, even in this church, by some of our members to, to imbibe that particular philosophy of living, and we didn't. And I would just be honest with you, we actually had some people that left this church over that issue. That's right. Um, the Word of God says something differently. The Word of God says that you're to develop a um, sound, biblical view of yourself. Now, invariably, people will object by saying, well, are, are you suggesting we ought to loathe ourselves? Is, is that it? Well, if you're not supposed to just love yourself and stand in front of a mirror and say how wonderful you are, are, are you suggesting that we ought to loathe ourselves? The answer to that is no as well, because that's an equally powerful ditch on the other side of the road. The biblical balance is learning how to make correct analyses of how we're doing either as individuals or as a church. That's what you see the Apostle Paul doing in this text. And so you see him at time acknowledging what was right. And there's benefit to that. It's an occasion to praise the Lord. That's why one of the takeaways from this particular text of Scripture was, thanks be to God. Uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord, on the one hand I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, on the other with my flesh the law of sin. But as Paul thought about who he was in Christ, the, the gospel indicatives, especially articulated in Romans chapter 6, and what he had been able to accomplish as an apostle as a result, he had plenty of reason to thank the Lord. And there was nothing wrong, there was nothing proud, there was nothing haughty of the apostle Paul in that context acknowledging what was right. That's the point, by the way, of Psalm 139, 14. Where the psalmist says, I'll give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Are you fearfully and wonderfully made this morning? If you can do this, you know, just try a little of that. I mean, if you can do any of that, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you realize that? But the problem, some of you remember during the self-love, self-image days, that, that people would quote Psalm 139 incompletely because they would say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, therefore I ought to praise me. Hello? You are fearfully and wonderfully made, but you didn't have like anything to do about it. Did you have anything to do with the design of your fingers? Seriously? Yes, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, and you ought to do what? What the text says at the beginning, I will praise him. It says there's absolutely nothing wrong with acknowledging your strength. You're going to be doing this for the rest of the day, aren't you? It's really kind of fun once you get it going. Um, get your feet going too, and well, anyway, but... 
God allowed you to do that. So, so let's go back to, let's pull out this um, second grade Sunday school teacher. If that Sunday school teacher is faithfully praying for her students, nothing wrong with saying, Lord, thank you for putting that desire in my heart and giving me the opportunity to pray directly to you. Or if that teacher has a passion for working with children, there's nothing wrong with her saying, thank you, Lord, for giving me this passion to, to want to teach children the truth of the Word of God. That is a strength. And there's absolutely nothing wrong. In fact, I would suggest it would be wrong not to acknowledge that God has given you that particular gift. It's not a wrongful boast. If it's a fact, it's an opportunity to think with sound judgment and therefore give the Lord praise. And I really think recognizing those kind of strengths, that is imperative for you to be able to make wise plans, in some case building on those strengths, there's also just the matter of confidence. See, Paul is calling us to some very challenging steps here, like Romans six twelve. therefore don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you would obey its lusts. There's a point for the personal improvement plan, right? There's something that could identify a weakness that we all struggle with, but remember, in its context, Paul has already said some things about you that are very strong. Therefore, we've been baptized, are buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. I'm simply suggesting that I can face my weaknesses, I can face the areas of life that I need to get better in as I acknowledge what he has already made me in Christ. So that information isn't there to make me puff up my chest, it's to help us think soberly about who we are in Christ and that's what gives us confidence to make plans to grow. I'm suggesting in each one of these areas, listing your strengths is a very healthy and appropriate thing, as long as you turn and praise God for what He has given. It's also an opportunity to place accomplishments in perspective. Now, that's another important piece of this puzzle as well. You may remember when Paul said this, if anyone else, this is in Philippians, has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I more. He said that. Circumcised the eighth day, that was true. Of the nation of Israel, that was true. Of the tribe of Benjamin, true. A Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is found in the law, I was blameless. All of that was true. Nothing wrong with him at all about acknowledging that. But if you know your Bible, you might say, yeah, just keep reading. Because what did he do with those strengths? He compared those strengths to his core values, and he said this, Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. In other words, when he ran that strength through the grid of his current core value, he deemed it to be a waste. I had a counselee once who took great pride in having the best lawn in his neighborhood. And you know what he did? He had the best lawn in his neighborhood, so much so that he wouldn't teach his teenage son how to mow the grass for fear that his son wouldn't keep the row marks as straight as he could. Sometimes we need to look at our strengths and accomplishments and then compare them to what we say really matters. This process can help us with that. Now, this balance also provides the authenticity of facing what needs to change. Some Bible teachers have really struggled with Romans chapter 7, where Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't do. The, the things I don't want to do, I do. They've really struggled with how could Paul say that. So some have taken the position, well, that Paul was not a Christian during that time. Or Paul was very immature at that time. And that's because they're uncomfortable admitting that messing up is still part of the Christian life, even for a mature, godly Christian. Well, I'll tell you that, that'll throw a wrench in this planning process. If you can't get honest about the ways you are weak, if you can't be honest about the ways you need to change, you will not make specific plans for how you need to grow. And I believe what Paul was saying in this text is the mark of maturity. It's the mark of authenticity. He could say what he said about his weaknesses in Romans 7 because of what he knew about his position and simultaneous victories of Romans 6. Now, I realize you might say it's true. This is a challenging passage. So you might say, you know, my head's kind of spinning around a little bit right now. Okay, fine. Let's kind of bring it down and talk about how does this work in the planning process. Well, you have to acknowledge your strengths. That's it. You have to acknowledge the way God has already helped you develop. 
So I'm encouraging you to, renew, or to review your strengths and to write out your strengths and to thank God for your strengths, to plan specific ways in the days ahead to build on your strengths. And you can do that in your personal life. Praise God for who you are in Christ. Praise God for how he's made you. Praise God for what he's already allowed you to accomplish. Because let's face it, for some people in this room, your story is incredible of what God has done in you, your experiences, your strengths, and he's going to want you to build on that in the days ahead, but you won't if you won't acknowledge his hand in what he's already done. I would encourage you to do that same thing as we think about analyze, um, or analyzing our church. There are a lot of ways that God has already strengthened us. And it's not proud, it's not arrogant for us to say that. I don't know how this strikes you, but our staff spends a fair amount of time talking about how bad we are and how we've just got to get to a better place. So when we have staff meetings every Wednesday, we're talking about we got to get better at this, we got to get better at this, we got to get better at this. We put a lot of staff time into thinking about how we stink. That's just all there is to it. And I'm talking about we are staff first and foremost, and oftentimes me, but, but that just, that's part of it. But every so often, that's the Romans 7 piece, but every so often we back up and say, you know what, even though we know we as a church have a long way to go, we're going to have, starting next Sunday night, 1,700 people show up here literally from around the world, many of whom would trade places with us in a heartbeat. And, and that's the balance. That's not arrogance. That's just simply acknowledging that God has allowed us through a great group of people to get a lot of good things done already. And that's not to make us proud, but that's to praise God and give us balance and joy. I would encourage you to do that same thing in your specific ministry. Why did God give you the gifts that he gave you? Uh, Pastor Green reminded us of a very important verse last Sunday night. It's 1 Peter 4.10. As each one has received a special gift, every person who knows Christ as Savior and Lord has at least one spiritual gift. Well, what is that for you? And have you taken the time to, to acknowledge that? And again, to do that in your work or your business. What are the areas of life the heirs of business life that you're already doing well, and can you build on that? So I'm encouraging you, think soberly about yourself to take time to analyze your strengths. Now, what's the other part of the equation? Here's where it gets very difficult for many people. Think about the two guys we talked about at the very beginning of the message. Friends, we have to take time and list the ways we need to improve. And if you can't acknowledge the ways you need to get better and the key effectiveness areas you've identified, you will never be able to plan wisely. People who are stubborn, people who are proud, people who are characterized by bravado and defensiveness, they are stuck. Mark it down. Other people will fly by them spiritually and vocationally because they weren't willing to be honest. They weren't willing to live appropriately in Romans chapter 7. I would encourage you to do that in your personal life, even this week, and to be thinking about what are some ways that I need to grow? What are some of the weaknesses that I have in these key areas of my life? And I also want to encourage you to do this. Ask someone to help you. Did you hear that? And you might have to say to someone, listen, I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to give you the pout thing but I really want to ask you to help me evaluate myself. Do you believe this, that faithful are the wounds of a friend? And what you may need right now, what I may need right now, is to bring some persons around who can help us complete this thought process of what Romans 7 looks like. What are the ways that we're not getting the job done? By the way, if you've never trusted Christ, I just want to pause and say to you that that's the first step in this whole planning process. A a and acknowledging the key weakness. I cannot save myself. My sin has separated me from God. That's the first step to being willing to embrace what he has done on the cross as your only hope of salvation. The same is true in our church. We better just decide right now, are we open for criticism? Just a few weeks, we're going to launch a series of surveys, some to our church family, some to our school family, some to our community. Essentially, we are asking people to criticize us, and then we intend to publish that data to help us as we plan. And some of it's going to be true, 
Some of it will be partially true. Some of it will be entirely false. But right now, we just need to get it in our hearts. Do we want the people in our community around us to criticize us, to help us identify the next hurdle that can help us become what God wants us to become? And I really believe this. I believe that kind of humility can be delightful. It really can. I asked this fellow if I could use this email, but um, one of our deacons missed a meeting this week, missed a meeting. And I thought it was interesting the way he responded to that after he realized that he missed it. He said, I need to ask you guys to forgive me for not being in attendance at the meeting Wednesday night. I thought I had communicated that I would be out of town, but clearly I failed to do that. Please forgive me. My actions communicated that this is not an important activity and that your time is not important. Nothing could be further from the truth. Do you see how delightful that is? Do you see how mature that is? Do you see how Romans 7 that is? And because he's so secure in his position in Christ, he gets his strengths. He can be honest with his weaknesses without this defensive pity party drama thing. Praise God for that, huh? May his tribe increase. The same is true in your specific ministry. You might want to ask the parents whose children you teach if that's what you're doing to evaluate you. You might want to ask students to evaluate you. You might want to ask friends to evaluate you. But to help you see ways faithful are the wounds of a friend And if you want to, even to do that in your business practices as well, if you have core values, find ways to invite criticism like Paul did in Romans 7. Well, we kind of have a choice here, don't we? Remember those two guys at the beginning of the message? Remember them? Which one would you want to be around? Which one do you think would be the most effective planner? And which one resembles you?